Good morning, GeoDeans. This is Mike Horton, project creator of the GeoNet Network. And today in the studio with me, I have an old friend, Darren Licardo. Darren is a Web2 venture capitalist investing in robots, drones, and autonomous technologies and all the cool technologies that support that industry. So welcome, Darren. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, so how'd you get into the, to the field of investing in robots, drones, and all this cool stuff? Um, well, it's actually a new career for me as of about seven years ago, but originally I was an operator engineer, um, worked for your very first company out of college Indeed. and cut my teeth uh, at Crossbow. Uh, and then I went on to automotive, uh, worked at BMW, and then I ran Tesla Autopilot, uh, and then I worked at DJI, building out their US office uh, before I eventually turned to the dark side of investing. Yep. Um, so I, I like things that go fast. I like cars and airplanes and, and robots and, and stuff that moves and interacts in the physical world. Yeah, it's a really cool career path. You've worked on some incredibly cool technology developments and it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, you also have, you're pretty into hobbies in this field too. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your <laughs> Your hobbies and how they interact with all the technology development that you're involved yeah, in. Yeah, no, I started flying model airplanes as a kid. My grandfather was a, a United captain, and once he had to retire because of mandatory retirement age, uh, he taught me how to fly model airplanes back in the days when it was balsa wood and uh, nitro glow fuel. Uh, <laughs> and, I mean, if you look at the trajectory of drones, wow, has that changed in the last 30 years. Um, it's just kind of incredible, right? I mean, starting with like brushless DC motors and speed controls and then LiPo batteries um, and just the amazing stuff now you can build in the quadcopter world just never existed uh, way back then when it was just, you know, balsa wood and glow fuel. Right. Um, so I still fly model airplanes. I've got a bunch of model airplanes hanging in my garage. I, I go out every couple of weeks and, and fly around and um, have fun with that. Uh, so again, I like things to go fast. That and a uh, little little bit of race car stuff I do, and then uh, and then I fly airplanes too. So uh, that's, that's that's the theme. <laughs> that's a pretty good that's a pretty good mix. <laughs> yeah. Model airplanes, drones, race cars, yep. and real airplanes. Yep. That's definitely it. the you full entourage. Yep. Amazing. So this whole physical AI thing is you know really come up in the last year or two. What do you think is making the timing now right for kind of robots to enter mainstream and enter our lives sort of in a day-to-day -day basis? What do you think's going on there? Yeah, I mean the cool thing about robots is it's very much a systems engineering problem and you have to have all of these ingredients come together such that you can build the entire system and make it um, attractive in terms mm -hmm. of performance, cost, and efficiency. And there are so many things that have come together really over the last decade or two uh, that just make it really exciting. Um, one of the things, of course, is GNNSS, which you know originally was really just a military system, and you know gradually became a sort of consumer right. system, and now has gone to the next level with all the stuff you're doing. Um, inertial systems, like starting with you know what right. what you did at right. Crossbow, um, which is now you know MIMS have proliferated into right. every consumer device pretty much. So those were all parts of ingredients and building blocks. And now, more recently, sort of the trends around AI and especially efficient embedded and physical AI are one of these like last ingredients, I think, that make sort of bringing robots into the physical world efficient and cost effective. And, and just I think there's a ton of opportunity across like all sorts of industries and all sorts of domains there. Yeah, I totally agree. I look at it as sort of right now is about when the iPhone 1 came out, like just yeah. that point. The screen, the compute, the battery, the, the, the wireless networks were upgraded enough to all make sort of an iPhone experience work. And I think we're right at that same sort of iPhone first generation moment for robots where these things can really enter, enter the mainstream consumer world. But there's still maybe a few roadblocks. I mean, you want it's, it's not still an easy field to, to make money in and invest in. And there's still a lot of, I think, robot companies that, that don't always make it. And so what do you think are the kind of the roadblocks that are remaining for robotics and drones to become really a widespread adopted? Yeah, well, I like to parse the market out. Um, in consumer robot robotics in particular, um, cost is kind of everything. Uh, and if you look at the trajectory of, of some of these robotics systems, um, it's just all about cost until drones mm -hmm. became... Uh, low cost enough that that it made sense from a consumer budget perspective. They just don't get adopted, and I think that you see that with floor vacuums. You know, mm -hmm. Same went through yeah, the same trajectory. 
Uh, and you know, there's lots of opportunities, like you said, but you've got to get those cost points right um, and that feature set right so that it's actually useful for a consumer. Um, and, and there's just there's lots of opportunities there. I mean, you know, labor, especially in the United States, continues to be a problem across many industries. And so there's always that pressure point where if you can do something useful and you can sort of be equivalent to what it would cost to otherwise pay for that with with a, a real human doing it, mm -hmm. then then you have an opportunity to to build a, a, a real business. I thought I was going to relate an interesting story to you. So when we were at Crossbow, like the first companies that really sort of started doing the auto steering and auto guidance for um, farming was based in Australia, right? Beeline, and then later John Deere got into it. Now it's really pretty pretty prolific auto steering for tractors. Well, the same thing seems to be going on in agriculture, again, with fully automated robots. So we see in Australia and New Zealand a much higher adoption rate of fully robotic systems, and their labor cost is probably two and a half times to do ag work as it is in the US. So I think it's that, yeah. it's that cost is higher there, so they adopt these things earlier in that territory, and that comes, comes more mainstream to the US. Yeah. Um, so what about drones? I mean, one of the things that strikes me about the drone industry is that the cost is there, the capability is there, but somehow the United States in particular has really lagged in essentially all of the consumer drone production and the vast, vast majority of commercial drone production is in China. And why do you think that is? Why has the U.S. lagged so much on drones? You know, it, it just it quickly became like a race to the bottom on, on cost and sort of China won that battle for mm -hmm. round one, I think you know, what people forgot about was things like, well, GPS was actually invented by the United States. Now there's GNSS systems from almost every country, uh, but we've lost a lot of that capability over the years just because of sort of an overly focused cost down exercise. And what's missing and coming back into the equation, I think is robustness around um, onshoring mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these critical technologies. Yeah. And so that will, hopefully redrive like a, a need and a, a way to make it um, effective to do that in the US again. So there's, again, lots of technology pieces to that entire equation, but uh, in principle, I think now drones have been around long enough that people realize all of the good and bad things that they can do. Uh, and so that's you know becoming sort of into the forefront of um, regulation and in, in will drive you know more more onshoring, which, which yeah, I think, I think there's the got to be an a re onshoring of some of these critical technologies. I look at the case of high performance GNSS, and currently there is no manufacturer in the U.S. that makes a consumer or a commercial grade GNSS in high volume. Um, there's some military GPS chips. There's some very expensive survey ones, but there's nothing like a U-Box or a Septentrio or any of the Asian manufacturers, none of that is made in the United States. There's no U.S. company doing it. Seems like a huge problem to me as part of GeoNet's roadmap to sort of publish an architecture that then a, you know, a silicon company can make in order to solve that because I think it's crazy that there's just no U.S. production of this type of technology. And I think it's true across a lot of things, whether it's, you know, Drone motors, for example, is another one that gets brought up all the time. I mean, where do you get a where do you get a six gram U.S. made yeah. motor for your for your drone? In China, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> these things are, I think, yeah. will change. They kind of yeah. have to. Otherwise, I, uh, I, I just think, I think the world does not want a world where there's only one producer of drones in, yeah. in the world. I think that's problematic. So lately, we've been talking a little bit about Web three, and I know you've got a GeoNet miner set up at your property in Oregon. And you kind of been looking around at it. How do you think Web3 and all this blockchain stuff could more broadly help the robot and drone industry? Yeah, so I mean, Web3 is a newish topic to me, and I'm having a lot of fun learning more about it from you and others. Um, and I think uh, what I'm realizing is that unlike some of the hypier crypto style meme stuff, what's interesting about tying it into physical AI is you can tie it into real productivity and work whether or not that's creating high precision differential GPS corrections or you know, collecting data sets that are useful for others, but creating that sort of two-sided economy mm -hmm. within the physical world 
um, has real value. And I think that's a great way to attach it to sort of a distributed blockchain so that people are incentivized on both sides, one to sort of collect the data or do that work and, and others that want to use or buy by the results of that work. So that that to me is like a fundamental principle that like makes sense. Um, and, and I'm kind of a guy of like fundamentals. So like, I don't really believe in kind of the hypey, right. hypey whatever. So this is why I'm more about like moving moving atoms around the world and doing yep. real stuff that's useful. And so I think there's a ton of opportunity there to incentivize that. And it makes a lot of sense to me, especially when you look at things like what you're doing at GeoNet where you need the scale to make it interesting. And so incentivizing that scale early on by doing what you guys have done, and now, I mean, how many base stations do you have? We have up? over 18,000. Um, that's an incredible number of base stations yeah, that could never uh, have been built like any other way, I don't think. Um, so that's an amazing way to incentivize that. And I think now it feels to me like, okay, you know, the magic of this is that you can get precise positioning. And I think a lot of people also don't realize how useful precise positioning is. Indeed. Um, and uh, they think that standard GPS is kind of good enough to do a bunch of stuff. But the reality is, is mostly not. You actually need, in many cases, when I look at problems, I'm like, you actually need better positioning than you think to do this elegantly yeah. and correctly. And so I think that's where things like working outside uh, in, in you know, interesting spaces, having robots do stuff like mowing lawns, et cetera, et cetera, is where this precise positioning will become really useful here in the next phase of this. Yeah, we're certainly excited about the future and we certainly think that real world crypto projects kind of bring together a really good use case for all this infrastructure that's been built with kind of crypto rails to transfer payments, to uh, validate, uh, you know, do proof of location, that, like what we do, use it for. It's a way to really decentralize thing and, and geospatial stuff in particular, it's just very inherently decentralized. So trying to do it in a centralized way is very difficult, very expensive, and also kind of very brittle in a certain way. So um, we found it to be really effective, and I think there are going to be more use cases that follow along the GeoNet model. So we're really excited about that. We're excited to try to expand the footprint deeper into drones and robots and help people build that out. So Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks, Darren, for joining yeah. us. And My pleasure. Um, to all you guys out there, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel, and we wish you happy mining. GeoNet, mine the sky.